7.30, so I think we're going to get started. So um, good, after good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the U.S. Center. Uh, this is our fifth U.S. Center at the COP, so we're happy to be continuing again this year. My name is Jenna Jaden. I'm a climate change specialist for the U.S. Agency for International Development, and I'll be the MC here for this week. Um, the U.S. Center, if you haven't been here before, you should know that it is a public diplomacy effort put on by the U.S. Department of State in order to showcase U.S. efforts both domestically and abroad that are aimed at combating and uh, adapting to climate change. So we're going to have a lot of different science and policy issues that we're going to be discussing over the next week or two. And speaking of that, we have a very packed schedule for the next two weeks. So if you enjoy what you see today, please grab a schedule on your way out and come back and check us out later. So with that, um, today we have our first event titled Climate Change in the World's Oceans. We have two speakers. Our first speaker is Carmen Booning. She's a scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. She has a PhD in physical oceanography and she studies the relationship between climate conditions, sea level rise, and ocean circulation. Our second speaker is Natalia Gallo, who is a biological oceanography PhD student at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego, and also is a fellow of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. She is studying how the synergistic effects of pH decrease, warming, and deoxygenation shape biological communities in the ocean. So with that, we'll bring up Carmen. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming to this event. I will be talking about the global uh, climate change and its relation to the world oceans. So the ocean's role is usually not very well recognized in, uh, in, in how it influences climate, and this is usually due to people just not having the, the opportunity and the chance to look at the oceans because, I mean, you see the weather and the climate that happens where you live in your neighborhood, but you don't see how the ocean actually affects the weather and the climate where you live. So what I'm going to talk about today is how NASA is helping us to understand the role of the ocean in uh, local and regional climate. And so I'm going to talk about uh, two of these areas shown on this slide, and then Natalia is talking about a third topic. So the three topics are sea level rise, the water cycle, and the carbon cycle. And the ocean plays a very big role in all of them. So when we, t when we look, for example, at sea level rise, uh, when the climate is, is warming, it uh, changes the sea level due to melting ice from glaciers in the ice sheets and it's uh, running off into the ocean. So you rise sea level and it's also uh, the warmer air temperatures are warming the ocean, so it's expanding. And so with sea level rise, we have a lot of impacts on coastal communities and, and island um, states. Uh, that are very vulnerable to sea level rise. And uh, people really like to settle down along the coast because not only because it's nice, because, but it, it also it's a good way for trading, for example. So there are actually a lot of people living at the coast, so they will be affected by sea level rise. And it's not only the permanent flooding that might occur if we have a huge amount of sea level rise, it's also the impact of erosion. When you think, for example, about limestone that gets eroded by uh, the ocean, and when the sea level is rising, you have more erosion. Or think about, for example, saltwater intrusion into freshwater uh, resources. So when the ocean is rising, you get uh, contamination of these freshwater sources. And then uh, also when the background sea level rises by, by a lot, then we have more vulnerability due to storm surges, for example. Then the ocean is also influencing the global water cycle quite a bit um, because uh, the Earth is covered by uh, to, 30, uh, to 71 percent 
by ocean, which is a very large amount. So this huge amount of water that's covering the Earth is actually affecting the water cycle, not only over the ocean, but also over land. So, um, so it's influencing the amount and uh, the, the frequency of uh, floods, of droughts. Um, it uh, has impact on extreme rainfall or just missing rainfall. And uh, we, we see uh, changes in the snow rain distribution. If it's getting warmer, snow uh, will, might be rain and, uh, and the connection to the oceans is there. And uh, due to the surface temperature of the ocean, we also have an effect on storms. Then the third topic will be uh, the carbon cycle. And uh, currently, the ocean serves as a net sink for car carbon dioxide. And so on the one hand, we're kind of lucky because the ocean takes up a lot of carbon. But then on the other hand, the creatures that live in the ocean are actually not that lucky because we have impacts in ocean uh, acid acidification and ocean deoxygenation by putting all this carbon into the ocean. And Natalia is going to talk about that later. So at NASA, we're very well known for our planetary missions and looking, for example, for water on Mars. And so we just recently landed the Mars rover uh, on, on Mars, which is a very successful mission. And it is maybe not that well known that we have a lot of dedicated Earth science missions that are also measuring the water on Earth. So this just shows the current NASA missions and their relation to what they observe over the ocean. So we have the JSON satellites, for example, measuring the sea surface height, which tells us uh, something about sea level rise. We have uh, ocean wind measurements uh, by the QuickScat mission, which tells us something about how the ocean circulation is driven. Then we have uh, the TRIM mission, which is uh, a measurement of precipitation, so we can monitor how precipitation is evolving over time. Then the Terra Aqua missions are giving us measurements of ocean surface temperature, which is critical for um, yeah, forcing um, precipitation events, uh, uh, deep convection, um, formation of clouds, etc. Then uh, one interesting mission is also the GRACE mission, which is two satellites that follow each other, measuring changes in Earth gravity. And what that tells us is basically how water mass is moving around the Earth. So the changes in gravity actually translate to a water mass change. And that, that's what this mission is giving us then. Then we have a bunch of plant missions, which are going to be launched in the, in the time frame of 2013 to 2023. And some of those ocean missions are con continuation missions of the missions we already have. We have a GRACE fall-on mission to be launched in 2017, which will then continue to measure the water mass change. We have a new high-resolution sea surface height measurement coming up with a SWAT mission that will give us more detail in the sea surface side, which tells us something about the ocean circulation. And so this chart is actually a little bit technical, but I just wanted to put it up to give you an impression of how we measure these different things. So we are basically scanning the Earth, the atmosphere, uh, the ocean surface, and the land by using different wavelengths um, from visible going uh, down to uh, microwave wavelength. And so by using these different wavelengths, we can actually scan different properties of the Earth uh, surface. And so I, in the following, I'm just going to focus on sea level rise and how the sea level rise connects to the water cycle and what we can learn from NASA observations about sea level rise. Uh, 
Okay, so this shows uh, what the latest IPCC report told us about what the different emission scenarios will produce in terms of sea level rise. On the left, we see two different projections. One is an extreme uh, emission uh, scenario, and, and the blue one is like a low emission scenario. And we see that those um, shaded spaces are still the uncertainties that exist in the model, so we still need to improve those models to have a better estimate of where sea level is headed because, I mean, a little change in those numbers has a big impact on policy making and the actual dollar amount spent on, on these policy decisions. And so what we're doing at NASA is basically using, using our observations to monitor the physical processes behind sea level rise. And this helps models to see where they need to improve, what areas, what processes they need to resolve to come up with a better prediction. So this shows what we're currently observing in terms of global mean sea level. That means that is the sea level averaged over the whole globe, and we get that from satellite altimetry. Uh, we, we started to have very accurate measurements in 1992. So we have now over 20 years of satellite altimetry data. And so this um, just illustrates that uh, we do see global mean sea level rising. It's rising at a rate of about 3.2 millimeters a year. But there's a lot of variability going on in this record, and we do want to understand what this variability means and where it comes from, because we want to be aware if something is happening to sea level and uh, if sea level is all of a sudden accelerating or decelerating and why that happens. So when you look at the curve, you notice a drop in 2010 to 2011. So when you, if you had just uh, this data and not the last part, you, you might want to think that uh, sea level is actually, actually decreasing. So, and, uh, so what we wanted to know is, is that something that's going to continue and what it is due to. Uh, so it could have two reasons. One reason would be the ocean could cool down, and that's what, what is uh, decreasing the sea level, or we have less water in the ocean. So we have those two explanations, and NASA satellite observation uh, give us a good impression of what happens here. So if you look at the scale again of this global mean sea level, that's millimeters of sea level, but also regionally, and this is what this movie shows here, it's uh, it varies quite a bit in a, in a centimeter range, in a like plus minus uh, 30 centimeters. And so what that tells us is um, that the uh, background rate at different locations might be different. And so, for example, island countries in the Pacific might get more affected by uh, sea level rise because we also have on top this uh, very high local variability. And so how can we um, determine the different contributions to sea level? I've mentioned the altimetry record before, and that's the total sea level, the total height of uh, the sea surface. And then uh, it constitutes of two processes. So we do have the GRACE mission, and I, as I explained before, uh, GRACE where, uh, measures the water mass change. So what that means is we get the contributions, for example, by um, ice sheets and glaciers that are on land and that are melting off and then adding water to the ocean. So this is the mass component of sea level. Then we also have a density component. What that means basically is uh, by changing the temperature of the ocean, we also either expanding or contracting it. So by warming the ocean, we also get an increase. Oh. 
uh, an increase in sea surface height. And we could just determine that, how much that is, by just subtracting the mass from the uh, total surface height. But we also have a complementary uh, measurement in the ocean, which is Argo floats. Those are these little devices, and people have put around 3,000 in the ocean, and they give us uh, global estimates of the um, temperature change in the um, upper 2,000 meters. So I've talked about this drop before. We were just curious what happened here. And so here, by combining these data sets, you can really tell what, where, what it was due to. So the black line shows, again, the altimetry. So this is just a short time period that was cut out. So it starts in 2005 instead of 1992. And then the drop happens uh, between 2010 and 2011. And so the blue line shows the change in ocean mass, the blue line in the bottom. And the red line shows the, uh, the thermal part. So uh, what we see here, that actually the temperature in the ocean didn't seem to change much, where it seems like there was a lot less water in the ocean. So, so we wanted to see why that was and where the water went. Because, I mean, if it's not in the ocean, it has to go somewhere. And so there uh, is where, where the GRACE uh, mission has a real advantage because we're getting global uh, estimates of water mass change. And this is what we've plotted here. Red shows where we have less water and blue shows where we have more water. The upper panel shows the water storage in 2010, the lower one in 2011. And so what we see here in those regions, when you focus on the on northern South America and Australia, you see there is a transition coming from a drought and going into um, a situation where you have wa more water in these regions. And so, so you might remember, for example, the floods they had in 2010 to 2011 in Australia, and so we found in this study, which I will explain later, that these floods were actually related to this drop we see in sea level. And so we wanted to quantify the amount of water that came from the ocean and was uh, precipitated over land. So we just focus on these regions where we see changes, that is Australia, Northern South America, and some part in um, Southeast Asia. And when you look, for example, at the green curve and at the orange curve, which are South America and Australia, you see this, this drop there, which says there was actually more water on the continents. And actually, Australia stands out a bit because there was nothing really going on. And then all of a sudden, it had more water. So what exactly happened there? Um, when we compare now the sum of these three regions to the change in global ocean mass, we see that just by looking at the water in these three regions uh, on the Earth, we, uh, we can explain this drop. So we really know from the satellite measurements where the water that was missing from the ocean went on the continents. And so this should just illustrate what uh, Australia's role was in all this. And so on top, we see the total amount, uh, again, in land water mass anomalies. Then the, the next panel shows the anomalies in Australia. And uh, what we see here, that that's what I mentioned before. We're coming out of a drought, and then we're getting those floods. And this increases the terrestrial water storage of Australia. But why exactly did it stay there? It's uh, usually water runs off quite quickly. And so we wouldn't see that much of a fluctuation in global mean sea level. But this is a very special case here of Australia. And we do have an explanation for that. So when you look at the runoff rates, 
over Australia, you see that in the middle of the continent, there's uh, just not that much runoff back into the ocean. So what that means is once it rains there, it'll stay there for a while and it, it doesn't have the opportunity to run back off in, into the ocean. So you, the only way you would get it out there would be by evaporation. So this was um, how the water was actually able to stay in Australia over that long of time. And so I've talked a little bit about um, the connection between sea level rise and the water cycle, how the, the um, land ocean water exchange is important to understand uh, what contributes to sea level rise, what the fluctuations are. And um, we've seen by using our observations that not only is it important uh, where the, w what the water exchange is, but in this case also what are the hydrologic properties of the continental regions. For example, Australia, we've seen there's uh, not much runoff in the middle of the continent, so the water stays there, which then contributes a huge amount to this drop in global mean sea level. Then also what, what we've seen, what I haven't shown uh, here, but what is a big factor is the wind systems that blow around uh, the moisture in the atmosphere and c are contributing to um, to bringing the water from ocean to land. And so we do see that NASA observations have quite a bit to inform modeling and where models need to improve to capture these processes and to be able to project in the end sea, sea level rise correctly. And so and wh what is important also about these studies is that um, we not only have one measurement of one thing, but we have a fleet of satellites that help us to get the different contributions of all the, the components in the Earth climate that help us to understand what's going on. So in this study in particular, we've looked at sea surface height changes, then we've looked at ocean winds, we looked at the precipitation, how that affects um, sea level, and then we looked at the water mass to see what the contributions are to sea level in, uh, in contrast to ocean warming or ocean cooling. So all these satellite measurements help us to get a big picture of what's going on and to better understand our climate. So what we have looked into in this study was ocean surface temperature and ocean salinity. Those are also very important measurements because they inform us about um, what the background conditions are for uh, deep convection, for forming clouds, for example, when you think about sea surface temperature or if you think about sea surface salinity, that gives us uh, some information, not only of the ocean circulation, but also how much uh, precipitation and evaporation we have over the ocean. So we talked about sea level rise and the water cycle. And the next talk is gonna be about the carbon cycle and how the uptake of carbon uh, influences the oceans, the oxygenation, and what impact it has on the fish and all creatures that live in the ocean. So this plot just shows a sketch of uh, how the general circulation in the ocean works, and in the end, it tells us something about how carbon is taken up into the ocean. So the red means the, it, it, the water's at the surface, the blue means the water's in the bottom. So what happens here is 
the water comes, the warm water comes from the tropics, it moves to the poles, it cools off, and uh, also due to sea ice formation, which extracts, no, which uh, leaves more salt behind in the ocean, we get dense water that then uh, goes down to the bottom, and uh, while it's doing that, it's taking up uh, carbon. So we have this conveyor belt that just transports carbon and all uh, kinds of ocean properties around the world. And so this is uh, a sketch of, no, it's a plot of data we have of the global sea air CO2 flux, and it's a collection of data from uh, ocean cruises. So this is why it looks so patchy, but what we see here, we cannot take up too much carbon in the tropics because it's too warm and the main uptake happens at high latitudes. And so we have a mission coming up that will actually help to understand these fluxes better. That is the OCO2 mission and then also the OCO3 mission. And this uh, gives us a, a good estimate of what the CO2 exchange between ocean and atmosphere is. So for example, when you look at the plot that has the, the green and blue bars, it tells us the green bars are the total emissions in the atmosphere, and the, the blue bars are uh, what, we, what we observe in terms of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So you see there's a big gap in uh, between the green and the blue, which means there's uptake by plants and there's uptake uh, by the ocean. And with this new mission, we're gonna get a sense of uh, wh to what extent it's the plants and to what extent it's the ocean. And I think uh, with this, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna hand over to Natalia. to be here today um, to tell you about one of the impacts climate change is happen having in the ocean that really hasn't had as much focus as I wish it and I hope it will have in the future. So climate change has three impacts in the ocean. It causes the oceans to warm, it causes them to become more acidic, so decrease in pH, and it also causes them to lose oxygen. And so today I'll be focusing on the loss of oxygen from the oceans. Um, and we know that scientifically as ocean deoxygenation, and so the ocean actually takes up more than 90% of the heat that's produced from anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And when the ocean warms, it has some really important consequences like deoxygenation. Um, and unfortunately, this is a fairly new problem. Even scientists have only started addressing it in the last 20 years. And so it hasn't received quite as much attention. But oxygen is fundamental for most life. We breathe oxygen, fish breathe oxygen through their gills. Um, pretty much all of the organisms you see in that coral reef require oxygen to live, and so oxygen is very fundamental. However, climate change actually causes oxygen levels in the ocean to decrease, um, and that's mostly due to warming. And we've actually seen that in the data. Globally, we have seen that the oceans are losing oxygen, and we've already seen biological consequences of this oxygen loss, because again, oxygen is very important to support life. Um, and the groups that are most sensitive to loss of oxygen are actually fish and crustaceans. So crustaceans being our crabs and our lobsters. So these are the groups that are really important for our fisheries. And so that's why a lot of countries should actually be interested in what's going on with oxygen loss on their coastlines and in the open ocean. Um, and so let's just take a moment and take a breath and think about what's in the air that we just inhaled. So about 21% of the air that you just inhaled is oxygen. And as Carol Turley will tell you, there are two lungs on this planet. One of the lungs is the terrestrial lung, and it's producing about half of the oxygen. And the other lung is our ocean lung. That's all of the algae that grow in the oceans, and that's producing 50% of the oxygen we breathe. So a lot of the oxygen that we're getting is actually coming from all of these small phytoplankton in the ocean. Um, in the ocean, there is oxygen, but it's there in a dissolved form, and it's much harder to get out of the water for marine organisms that live in there. 
And oxygen content in the ocean is dependent on the temperature, the amount of mixing that's occurring at the surface, and then the biology. So biology produces oxygen through photosynthesis, and it uses up oxygen through respiration. So we respire, and all of the organisms in the ocean also respire, thereby using oxygen. And climate change has a negative impact on all three of these. And so we'll just do a little intuition building so we can all become comfortable with why climate change would negatively impact oxygen levels in the ocean. So first of all, warm water holds less oxygen. We can do many experiments in the lab. It's a very s simple physical property, and we see that when temperature increases, the amount of gas that water can hold decreases. And so because of that, just simply when you warm the water, it's going to be able to hold less oxygen. Um, and we can actually see this in the lab, but then we can actually see this in the data from the ocean, where the tropics in light purple are areas with low oxygen, um, and the tropics are the areas with the lowest oxygen at the surface, because warm water can simply hold less oxygen, whereas polar regions have higher oxygen content, just because of the property that cold water can hold more oxygen. Um, and then warm water is harder to mix, so when you get warming at the surface from climate change, it becomes more difficult to mix that water. When you can mix more water, you can get more oxygen into the water from the atmosphere. When you can mix less water due to that warming, you get a stratified water column. That means that everything outside of that mix layer is no longer in contact with the atmosphere. And a lot of biological respiration is going on at those mid-depth levels. So if you can't mix the oxygen in there, it's going to get depleted much more rapidly. Um, another reason why warming leads to more oxygen use is because when it's warmer, you actually breathe more, you respire more, you use more oxygen. And so that's what's going on in the ocean with all of the organisms that live there. The ocean is full of bacteria, so there are about a million bacteria in every milliliter of seawater. And all of those bacteria are utilizing oxygen. So that, and when the temperatures increase, you also get increased respiration. Um, and so a lot of times you get increased respiration in areas where there's high productivity. So whenever you have a big algae bloom, for example, and once the algae bloom sinks out of the water column, it gets decomposed by all of those bacteria, and that leads to a reduction in oxygen. So whenever you get increased nutrients, whether that's through sewage runoff or fertilizer runoff, or whenever you get increased nutrients due to upwelling, so coastal circulation, nutrient-rich water coming up, you're going to be in a situation where you have high surface productivity and then more decomposition at depth. Um, and so coastally, we have a lot of hypoxic areas. So hypoxia is simply defined as an oxygen concentration that's detrimental to life. So in most areas, most organisms can't live in a hypoxic zone. Some are specifically adapted for it, but most animals can't live in those areas. And so um, in red, you can see all of the coastal hypoxic zones. There are more than 400 identified now. And so these usually correspond to areas with dense populations. And so these are primarily driven by a lot of nutrient runoff from our farms, from sewage. And so most parts of the world with dense population have these coastal hypoxic zones. And so if you actually go on Google Earth and you go into Google Ocean, you can take a look to see all of the hypoxic areas that have been identified in your own area. So that's us at the National Stadium, and you can see the Baltic Sea actually has quite a few hypoxic zones. Um, there are also open ocean low oxygen zones. We call these oxygen minimum zones. And they're naturally occurring. They're because we have really nutrient-rich water at the surface, and once we have high productivity at the surface and it sinks down and gets decomposed, it utilizes a lot of the oxygen. And so we have these large oxygen minimum zones, particularly in the Pacific. And so in this map, everything that's not gray is a part of the ocean that has hypoxic waters. Um, and so we see really large areas of that in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, and then we also have hypoxic areas off of the west coast of Africa. And so where these hypoxic zones actually butt up against the continental margins, that really impacts our fisheries because a lot of our fisheries target the continental margins. And these are large areas where fish, most fish that we like to fish can't live. Um, and so the total hypoxic area on the continental margins, so a lot of the places we like to fish, um, it's greater than the area of Poland and France combined. So you're really talking about large areas where most fish that we like to fish can't live. 
Um, and so not only are they large in area, they're about 8% of the total ocean area, but they're also very deep. So you can have parts of the ocean where you can have a thousand meters of water that's hypoxic, which can't support most normal aerobic life. And so one of the main points is that this is a very widespread problem and probably whether you have a coastal hypoxic zone due to runoff or you have an oceanic zone due to your location, or an oceanic low oxygen zone due to your location, most coastlines actually have a low oxygen problem. And this low oxygen problem gets exacerbated when you experience surface warming because of the properties of how warming affects oxygen content in water. Um, and so we've actually seen um, in our data that there has been a decrease in oxygen. And the new assessment, IPCC assessment five report, actually predicted that by the end of the 21st century, you'll see a three to 6% decline in global oxygen levels in the ocean. But this is just an average value. And so what you actually see in this graph in the blue, on the top panel in the blue, you see areas that are already low in oxygen. And then in the second panel, in the blue, you see the areas that are going to lose the most oxygen and have lost oxygen already. And what you can see is that the areas that are already limited on oxygen are the ones that are losing the most oxygen. And so that's important. And you can actually see the expansion of these low oxygen areas through the water column. So between 1960 and today, you can see that the depth occupied by these low oxygen hypoxic areas in the water have expanded. Um, and so what that means for us on the coastlines is as these areas expand, they also shoal, so they become shallower. They get closer to our coast, and our coasts now actually face this low oxygen water that is coming up and affecting some of the fish. And we've seen off of the coast of California in the last 22 years a 21% decrease in mean oxygen content at about 300 meters, and coastally a shoaling of about 100 meters um, of the hypoxic layer. And so where that hip the depth of the hypoxic layer is what really affects a lot of your coastal organisms. Um, and so what we can see when we look at physiology in the lab is that there are certain groups that are most sensitive to low oxygen. And we can look at this in terms of lethal concentrations, and so what causes an organism to die, or we can look at this with sublethal concentrations, so what causes an organism to grow less or to reproduce less. And we can see that for both of these, crustaceans and fish are our most sensitive groups. And we can see that in the lab, but we can also see that in the field. We have mortality events, large mortality events in the Gulf of Mexico. When you get a hypoxic area, you have a low oxygen event, you have dead fish. This is a really fast impact. We also see that off of the coast of Africa where there's low oxygen water that shoals. Crustaceans, lobsters will just walk out of the ocean because the oxygen is too low for them and you'll have a widespread mortality event. And so we can see this most recently off of Oregon, where before the Oregon coastline did not have a lot of anoxic and hypoxic events, but recently, since 2002, because of the shoaling of this oxygen minimum zone and this low oxygen water, they've actually been experiencing a lot more low oxygen mortality events. And starting in 2002, they saw 75% mortality of the Dungeness crab, which is a really big, important fishery off of Oregon. And then also in these ROV surveys, you can see a healthy fish community prior to 2002, and then pretty much all of their ROV surveys after 2002 saw a lot of dead fish and invertebrates along the bottom because of these low oxygen events. And so what that means for the greater ocean, um, it results in habitat expansions and contractions. So there's some organisms that actually really like low oxygen because they've been adapted to it through evolutionary time. So this fish on the right actually does great with very low oxygen concentrations. And so organisms like that will see their range expand. But organisms that need high oxygen to survive, and so those are our tunas, our billfish, they actually are experiencing habitat contraction because all of a sudden they can't use as much of the water column as they did previously. And so we've already seen a 15% reduction in the habitat of tuna in the Atlantic um, because of the, sh the expansion of these low oxygen areas. Um, there's also been a decline um, in mesopelagic fish. So these are small midwater fish that are really a very important component of the food web. They feed everything at the top levels of the food web. And so they're very sensitive to low oxygen. Um, and then also we've seen habitat expansion of the Humboldt squid. So the Humboldt squid can do well in low oxygen conditions. And it actually has expanded all along the west coast of the US. Um, and 
they compete with hake and they also eat hake. So the hake fishery has not been doing as well, but the fishery on Humboldt squid has been doing better. Um, and so a really important point is that low oxygen areas are carbon dioxide maximum areas. Um, whenever you use oxygen, you produce carbon dioxide. That's just through respiration. And so whenever we see an area that's low in oxygen, it's always high in carbon dioxide. So when we see the shoaling of these low oxygen areas, we actually see the shoaling of very low pH water. Um, and so that's exactly what we've been seeing off of the west coast of the United States, where some of the water that's coming up is 7.6, 7.75, very, very low pH. Um, and what that also means is it has very high CO2 concentrations. And so some of these waters are 1,200. Um, and for example, surface is 400 um, parts per million. And so this is actually water that is net fluxing carbon dioxide out of the water instead of taking it up. So there are some important feedback implications. So we really need to pay attention to ocean deoxygenation because it has very important biological effects. We know that it's declining and we know that it will decline in the future um, with, with surface warming. Um, and we know that it probably will have some important impacts for a lot of coastal economies. Um, however, because it's such a new topic, it really hasn't had too much of a focus and it didn't make it into the summary for policymakers, even though it's really a problem policymakers should be thinking about because it can impact their local economies. Um, and so small changes in temperature can have very drastic impacts on oxygen content. So just a one degree increase in surface warming will triple your suboxic zones and increase your hypoxic areas by 10%. Um, we know that it has profound consequences on biodiversity, on fisheries income. Um, and we know that it also has environmental feedbacks in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because a, gr a really potent greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide, is produced in low oxygen areas. And in the historic record, we actually see that um, oxygen depleted areas in the ocean are very tightly correlated with warming periods. So we know how this works in the past. And so with that, I would just like to say thank you for listening to this presentation. And um, I'm here as a part of a group of Scripps students, we're graduate students, and we really want to try and communicate our research to um, more of a public policy audience as well as a public audience. And so there's more information about how climate change is affecting the oceans at this website, oceanscientist.org. And also there's a, an oceans booth here, 102, on this floor. So if you have any other questions about ocean impacts of climate change, um, please come and talk to us. So thank you. Is it on? Okay. Um, thanks, Natalia and Carmen. Um, so now it's time for the audience. If you have any questions, uh, raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone over to you. I also want to give a shout out to the Ustream audience. I'm not sure what camera you're at over there. But if you guys have any questions, also please uh, send them in via the chat box and we will ask those. And please state your name and affiliation. Thank you. I'm Andrei Kranz from Slovenia. Uh, I, want to, I apologize if you said this maybe before I arrived here, but uh, you said that less uh, oxygen can be dissolved in the water in, at higher temperatures, but uh, oxygen is used to produce uh, CO2 uh, at the same time. So does it affect the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere? Um, does it go out of the water or is it consumed, consumed all of it for production of CO2? Because I read somewhere that the concentration of CO2 has decreased in recent decades in the atmosphere. So what is the truth? Thanks. So I don't, I can't answer the, the fact about the carbon dioxide decrease in the atmosphere. Um, I do know that we can see increases in oxygen content in the atmosphere because of less take up by the ocean. Um, however, because there's so much oxygen, there's 21% of the air we breathe is oxygen, it doesn't really affect us so much on land. Um, so the physiological effects of oxygen loss in the ocean are a lot more important than the physiological gains of oxygen in the atmosphere, but we can see that in the measurements. Thank you for the nice presentation. My name is Haile, I'm from Ethiopia. Uh, my question is for the second presenter. Uh, you have mentioned the formation of low oxygen zones and why they are formed, but you've also mentioned that expanding. Uh, 
why are they expanding? Um, so they're expanding primarily due to those three different factors. So decreases in oxygen solubility due to temperature at the surface. So whenever you have warmer temperature at the surface, less oxygen can dissolve in that water. You're also getting reductions in mixing, which is reducing how much water, ac how much oxygen actually gets into the water through mixing into the deep ocean. And that's because of increased stratification through warming. And then you also have changes in the use versus the production of oxygen. So the biological factors. And so um, those are a little bit more complicated, but um, in general, you're getting more use of oxygen now than you did before. So all three of those factors are decreasing and expanding these low oxygen areas. Uh, hi, my name is Michael I'm from Poland. And my question is, you mentioned that the um, area where the tuna, for example, lives, and right now it's going to be populated by fishes which um, can live there. And I'm my question is maybe, can we eat those fishes? Is it maybe that we can use it as an advantage maybe? That's, that's my question. Um, yeah, actually, that's a really, really great question. Can we adapt to these changes? Um, so there are some fish. The Dover sole is a flatfish that gets fished off of California. Um, the adult life stages of that fish can actually live okay in low oxygen, and that's a fishery species. So that's one that wins. But it's most of the fish that live in low oxygen are not fish that we would be able to use. Um, for fishery purposes. So really Dover sole is the only one that I know of. Um, usually the, these are deep water fish, so they grow much more slowly. Um, so they're not really the type of species you wanna depend on for a protein source. And a lot of the midwater ones are really tiny, so we can't really use them. Hi, um, my name's Carol Turley. I loved your talks. Uh, both of them were, were extraordinary talks, um, all about the water cycle. Um, what can we do about it? I mean, this is why we're here at the UNFCCC COP. You know, what's your message to all the policy makers here, all the delegates? What can we do about uh, the issues about the ocean and the water cycle? And I'd like you both to answer it in your own way. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I think that's a very tough question, uh, what to actually do about this. I think uh, we do need to think a lot about mitigation, but uh, as we see now from the observations, not only of the physical properties, but also the biological properties, the we, we also need to start about uh, thinking about uh, adaptation to what is going on because we're already seeing some changes. So I think that would be my recommendation. Um, yeah, that would be my recommendation too. I think, um, I mean, obviously these are all CO2 problems, so reducing emissions, that's the number one goal. Um, however, a lot of these are occurring already and what we need to do is adapt to those. And so whether that's come up with a really good way to eat Humboldt squid and make that your, you know, make that your favorite meal instead of a hake, you know, pasta, I don't know, um, but, <laughs> you know, adapt, adapt, really make sure you work with local fishermen to make sure that they're focusing on, you know, food sources that aren't going to be depleted, make sure that, um, so one of the interesting things about oxygen, especially for these coastal areas, it's eutrophication, nutrient runoff, fertilizer runoff, sewage runoff, that's really driving this increase in nutrients at the surface, which is leading to these low oxygen areas coastally. So I think that if we know that climate change is going to exacerbate that problem, we need to start looking at how we can reduce the nutrient inputs more. So. Hi, um, I'm a journalist from Buenos Aires, and recently the um, mission Aquarius that uh, NASA shared with uh, Ar Argentina, uh, I was wondering if salinity uh, uh, is related with uh, CO2 in, in the oceans, or is completely another thing? Um, yeah, so it, it actually is a little bit. Um, so more saline water can take up less gas. 
So when you have fresher water, fresher water can take up more CO2. And that's one of the reasons why in areas like the Arctic, where you're getting a lot of melting of sea ice, you're actually seeing more absorption of carbon dioxide in those areas and more regional pH decreases. Um, so that's, that's, I think, the link that I can think of. Yeah, maybe. I think also, I mean, you can use the Aquarius satellite data to s look at the regions where you have upwelling, which then also uh, contributes to your carbon flux. So, for example, in a region of, of upwelling, uh, we see a different uh, salinity content that we that we would see in, in other areas. So there is kind of an indirect application of the salinity data in terms of carbon uptake and uh, outgassing. Hi, my, my name is Laura Applegate and I'm from the Sea Trust Institute in the United States. Um, I was just wondering, you said that now there are 8% of our oceans are hypoxic zones. Do you know the data from previous years? Like what percentages, say 20 years ago? Um, no, I'm not sure. So a part of the problem with this being a fairly new problem mm -hmm. is the fact that we don't have great baseline data. So when that's, I think that's from a 2011 study when that 8% area came out, um, they actually realized that before that they had pretty grossly underestimated how much of the ocean, the open ocean had these hypoxic areas. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I can't give you a percentage or yeah, for like 20, 30 years ago, that would be interesting, but would be. yeah. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Olivia Santiago. I'm from Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I was wondering if there are any direct or specific mechanisms that you can implement on an ecosystem base basis to um, increase resilience to deoxygenation. So I think that, so on an ecosystem level, there are many different stressors that are impacting, say, a coastal ecosystem. And so I think at an ecosystem level, um, the response would be to decrease additional other stressors. So whether that's fishing pressure, whether that's pollution pressure, um, I think that's probably the best way to deal with deoxygenation. Carol Turley again. Um, you're talking about adaptation versus mitigation. And I'd put it to you that adaptation, in, in a sense, is only buying time for mitigation, for us all to get our act together. So in, in, in other words, uh, when you're talking about um, you know, human adaptation, perhaps turning to the Humboldt squid or something for, for food, um, th there has to be a point where that Humboldt squid actually a threshold for oxygen, for acidification, for warming. And, you know, so at some point that's going to go as well and we'll be left with marine bacteria and things like that to eat. You know, so so, so adaptation isn't really the, the it's only buying time. Would, would you agree with that or, or, or not? Yeah, um, I would definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, after the squid, your your next group that's really resilient to low oxygen is jellyfish. So mm -hmm. I don't think we want to be eating jellyfish. So it's definitely only applying <laughs> time. Yeah, we definitely need to deal with the problem, and the problem is CO two. Yeah, I think the same holds for the physical properties as well. If you think about sea level rise, you could buy, uh, you could uh, build sea walls, for example, or move your buildings uh, more into the country, but I mean, that's only a temporary solution. So mitigation is really uh, what we should be aiming at. Any last questions? Okay, thank you. Let's have a round of applause for our two wonderful speakers. And we'd of course also like to thank all of you for coming and hope you come back later. Our next talk today is at four o'clock and it's from the USDA and it's about the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, which is an international partnership aimed at reducing agricultural GHGs. So stop by later, thanks. <laughs>